14 years ago, I decided to sell everything I had. I bought a one-way ticket to come to the Bay Area because I had an idea for a technology company, a software company. I knew nothing about software and tech. And I thought that, you know, what better place to be than the Silicon Valley to, to do so. And, and what followed was a five-year period of just being punched in the face every single day, <laughs> metaphorically speaking, yeah. not really <laughs> physically speaking. And, and the biggest failure of my life, right? The, the kind of most soul-crushing failure and defeat. What is up, everyone? Uh, welcome back to the Art of the Fail. Uh, super pumped for today's episode. It also just happens to be season two finale. Finale. S- finale. So whether you're watching or just listening to the audio, uh, we've got a good one for you today. A really, really, really good one, actually. So today's guest of honor uh, is someone who is a sales, marketing, slash just all-around startup guru. And I typically like I'm pretty reserved when I use that word. I don't I don't really <laughs> like that word, but but he is definitely a guru. Seems when it fitting comes, today. It's, it's very fitting. Uh, and you guys will soon find out why. Uh, he's also an author, co-host of his own podcast, uh, The Startup Chat, and founder and CEO of Close I.O. Steli FD. Welcome to the show. What an intro. What an intro. Thank you so much I try. for having me. <laughs> it's, it's about the only thing I do on the show, so I figure <laughs> I, I might as well get a good intro and then Chris can kind He's of not just lying. take over. No, I'm actually not lying at all. <laughs> I like it. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so like Chris said, we're just going to hop into a couple quick questions. That, that way everyone who is listening or watching right now can, uh, can get to know you a little bit more on a, on a personal level. So let's, let's get to it. First question. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Espresso. Nice. Well, that's actually a perfect segue to my next question. Coffee or tea? I think you've just answered that one. Espresso it is. Uh, Hustle or talent? Which one would you choose? Hustle. Awesome. A favorite book of all time, if you have one. You could say your own. No, um... Favorite advice on book of all time is to go and read books you've read uh, five years or long ago and you hate it uh, because you are changing. So the experience with a book might change. I don't like to give specific recommendations, mm-hmm. but to give one that, that is probably unusual for this is um, a, a book by John kabat uh, Wherever you go, there you are. It's a small book about mindfulness. And it comes from somebody that's very kind of science, uh, has a strong science background and kind of a, a strong scientific backgrounds it's not like super loosey-goosey on the mindfulness and the meditation side of things it's a small book but really impactful so i i recommend it frequently awesome i think i'll have to check that one out (laughs) (laughs) what 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 do your friends call you do you have any nicknames chris chris wants to know just steli okay (laughs) i I told you chris Nobody has any other nickname for me now. Well, maybe uh, maybe we'll come up with one by the end of the show. Uh, <laughs> most important functional area of any business. Most important functional area of any business. I don't fucking know. Whatever, uh, what, whatever it is that that uh, turns uh, people into customers. So sa- sales would be a really big important part. But I don't think. I think really it's a collective of things, mm-hmm. uh, but at the center of everything you do should be a focus on your customers. Awesome. Uh, and last question, what what's your why? So like what gets you out of bed in the morning? What's my why? I have many whys. Uh, I don't know if somebody has just one singular why in life. Um, there's a cliche, uh, you know, that's, you know, uh, my my family is a, is a big why and my friends, mm-hmm. people in my life. I think people really, uh, to, to a large degree, doesn't matter if it's my children, uh, if it's my mom, who's one of my biggest heroes, if it's my brothers. My, there's a lot of family that I have um, that drive a lot of the things that I do. There's friends. Um, I think externally, I, you know, my why are people. Like, I love people. I love seeing people flourish and grow. Um, so a lot of the things that I do relate to that in one way or another. Um, and another big why 
that is internally mm -hmm. focused is uh, change and growth, right? So to me, the best, the best day ever is a day where I change my mind or where I grow in some way that's uncomfortable. Uh, if I look back a year for, a year ago and I feel like a bunch of things that I thought and did a year ago were totally idiotic and totally wrong, that's a good year for me. That, that I, can, um, I can say that I was happy this year and fulfilled, right? Because I right. learned and I grew. The worst thing that can ever happen is um, where I look back a year and I'm like, I don't know if I changed that much. I don't really change my mind on anything. Um, I get really unhappy internally because it doesn't matter how, how financially successful I am. It doesn't matter how many nice things people say about me. It means I'm not growing and that makes me really, really uncomfortable. Right. Awesome. Love that. Yeah. Great answer. Thank you. That's it for the questions. And the last of all questions. Right. You, yeah. You can ask it. Are you ready to get into some fails? Oh yeah. That's the one area I do feel like I'm a guru. In everything else. I'm not, I'm not Perfect. So sure about Good. It. Yes. Let's Good. talk about failing. So Steli, um, before we get into some longer anecdotes about failure um why don't we start uh with a little bit of background uh, about you so if i'm not mistaken you were born in greece grew up in germany um yep. you know take us to the beginning and and walk us through how you became the steli fd of today oh uh, yeah well uh we <laughs> Giving you an answer to that that's not 45 minutes long will be a challenge. <laughs> well, I'll do my best. The Coles um, Notes. The Coles Notes version, yep. The, okay, so uh, I had a, uh, a challenging childhood for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, there was a lot of like drama in my childhood, a lot of things that didn't work out quite as well. A lot of death. Uh, in my family, a lot of uh, financial challenges, just a lot of, like when I think about my childhood, um, it, it's definitely kind of a black and white, dark mood kind of a memory and not like a colorful, mm -hmm. happy, go lucky uh, childhood. I think that um, for up till the age of 16, I was a little lost. Um, I was really struggling in school and hated the experience there. I didn't really have any direction for my life. I was just spending most of my day watching television and getting in trouble. Uh, so, so. Um, but I, I did have the desire, the need to do great things. I wanted to be somebody that would succeed in life. I wanted to prove the world wrong in my mind. Everybody thought I was uh, not going to amount to anything, so I had the chip on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. But I really didn't know what to do about it. Um, and I was lucky. I had like one big argument with uh, an older brother of mine, and that is the moment. If I have to trace it back to what started – my journey and got me to where I am today was that big argument. It was an argument about success in life. And I had two older brothers. Both of them were kind of tough guys, bouncers in clubs, and also not very successful in school. Uh, <laughs> and both of them also watched way too much television and way too many gangster movies. So the, the argument that we had was about success. In our, in our limited minds back then, a success meant money, right? Because we didn't have any. Right. And um, my brother's side of the argument was basically to become successful, you have two choices in life. Either you become academically successful and become a doctor or a lawyer, or you have to do illegal things, sell drugs and do something else to make a lot of money. And I hated both these options. Uh, it didn't seem very appealing to me. So I argued back that there can't be just two ways. There must be other ways as well. And mm -hmm. we went back and forth until at some point he looked at me and he was like, all right, smart ass, what's your plan for success? How are you going to get rich? And I opened my mouth and no words came out, right? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And that moment made me realize how clueless I was. And that started off everything because that made me go, holy shit, I'm 16. I've always operated under the assumption that I'm going to become very successful, but I don't know what the fuck that means. How exactly am I going to be successful? And, and that led to a series of events. Uh, one of the most significant was that they led to me buy the first book I've ever bought in my life and mm -hmm. read the first book that I'd ever read up until that point when I was 16. And um, that, through a few twists and turns, made me discover entrepreneurship because it didn't really exist in my world, like in school, in, in the 
in the industrialized Germany, they wouldn't tell you that you could be in business on your own and be an entrepreneur. My family, there was nobody that was ever an entrepreneur. Everybody worked in a factory. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I once I discovered entrepreneurship and I realized that anybody can start a business, I don't need to have a PhD or a certificate to do so. And the success of that business was not limited by my name, by my resources, by my background, but by my hard work and the value I was able to, to provide. I was like, all right, that's it. I'm gonna start a business. I'm gonna be an entrepreneur. I'm gonna be my own boss. And that really led to all other series of events that got me to where I am today. But that was really the big turning point in my life. And, and that led to me dropping out of school when I was 17. I started my first business and I did a few small businesses back in Europe. And then 14 years ago, I decided to sell everything I had. I bought a one-way ticket to come to the Bay Area because I had an idea for a technology company, a software company. I knew nothing about software and tech. And I thought that, you know, what better place to be than the Silicon Valley to, to do so. And, and what followed was a five-year period of just being punched in the face every single day, <laughs> metaphorically speaking, yeah. not really <laughs> physically speaking. And, and the biggest failure of my life, right, the, the kind of most soul-crushing failure and defeat. And that was the, 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 the university I needed to then start another business and take those lessons learned and mm -hmm. through a few twists and turns run a, a pretty successful business today. So what was that big soul crushing um, failure? Was that just when you came to the US and it was five years of just grueling back and forth or was there sort of more granular things that happened? Yeah, so many things. Um, I think that I saw a number of things. I think that um, when I came to the US, I had this, you know, ignorant and arrogant worldview where I was like, I'm going to move to the US. It's going to be a great adventure. And in two years, I'm going to be uh, you know, running a billion dollar business, be Steve Jobs' best friend, and be Time Magazine person of the year, right? <laughs> so so uh, nobody has to do any Googling right now. None of that happened, obviously. <laughs> um, and so, so I, I struggled so hard on every level possible, and I was not prepared for that. I mean, from just cultural things, just not understanding the culture as well as I mm -hmm. thought by just watching a bunch of movies to not speaking the language well. Like I sounded for the first three years, four years living in the US, I just sounded like an idiot to my like to my own ears. Everything I was saying sounded dumb because I couldn't articulate myself as well as I uh, was used to. Right. To being able to get a visa was an incredible struggle. Um, to, I remember you telling that story. That that's one of the ones. Yeah. 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 To 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 finding friends. To then like I didn't know anything about building a technology business or a software company. I didn't know anything about raising money. Mm -hmm. I basically I played in such a small league. Right. I was like a, a you know I was, I was playing basketball on weekends as a hobby with a bunch of friends and I was the best player there and I then went to the NBA you know to play there it's just a very, very big jump so I made right. every mistake possible a hundred times and and I was so attached to that idea I felt like that idea was the idea that would change the world and it was the reason I existed I made this such a big deal that I was so attached to what I was doing that I was not able to accept defeat and failure mm -hmm. because it meant I would be a failure as a human being. So the company was dead after two years and I kept going for another three years mm -hmm. pretending it wasn't dead, right? It was like I was right. walking into rooms with a skeleton and I was like, no, 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 no. It's totally fine. All it needs <laughs> is some water yeah. and some food and it's going to be alive again. Yeah, as well. yeah. and, and, and so and, and slowly but surely I, I had all these incredibly bad habits and also bad ideas about entrepreneurship. Uh, of like grinding 16 hours a day, seven days a week, ne never taking a break. I had this like 80s baby mind frame of like you have to suffer, like this Rocky movie kind of like you have to as a hero <laughs> Raw suffer. eggs in the morning. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you just have to like get punched in the face and suffer and suffer. And then yeah. at the end, you're the hero yep. that raises out of the ashes. And it's like, and, and so um, I just, I, I developed an incredible amount of bad habits that led to me just getting not just financially broke, but emotionally broke, right. spiritually broke, physically broke. And, and eventually I could not but accept the fee or, or, or raise the, the white flag. But it took a lot out of me. And, and it was an important 
I, I learned a lot of things the hard way because I was not smart enough to learn them the easy one. Mm -hmm. But um, it was really a challenge on all levels, not just the business didn't work, just everything uh, wasn't working the way I expected it to. Yeah, well, there's a bunch of things in there that maybe we can unpack too. Um, unpack. I love. I love, <laughs> I love when you say that. Unpack. I was like, we, we've got like gifts in front of us, and it's like, who, yeah, who's turning all of these to giant unpack? fuck ups that stelly has been the, through. The gifts. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you. Do you think that you had to go through those, you know, challenges? And and I think the secondary question to that um, is in order to play in the big leagues, which I would argue is where you're playing now, did you have to throw yourself into the NBA, uh, so to speak? So um, I think I had to go through this, mm -hmm. but I don't think everybody has to. Okay. I don't believe that. There's zero proof for that. Yeah. Right? There's right. a lot of people that for whatever reason, some might be nature, some might be nurture, for whatever reason, they didn't have to go through a lifelong of failures before they became successful. They became successful right away, yep. right? Uh, they held on to that success. Some people lost that success and be became uh, Do you became think that those are anomalies, though? Yeah, I definitely do think that those are anomalies. I, I, I think that, um, but I also think that I am an anomaly in the sense that the amount of pain I went through and the <laughs> amount of failures <laughs> I went through is not necessary the amount of failures everybody has to go through. I think that some right. people are wising. I think the average person would wisen up a lot quicker or lowers their expectation, okay. right? So adjust right, right. to something more realistic to where they are and what they really want. I think I'm an anomaly in the sense that I put myself in a very, very hard position and then I didn't give up, mm -hmm. but I but I suffered through it. I think that, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, Somebody smarter than me could have gone through that experience a little faster. Um, but I think a lot of people that are not as persistent as me or as emotionally, I don't know, prone to suffering and dealing with that suffering would have would have stopped or quit it, right? So I'm kind right. of this, in this weird mode where I was not smart enough to learn fast, but I was uh, persistent enough not to give up. Fair and, enough. And, and yep. for me... I had to learn these lessons. Now, I, you know, I could have learned them differently, but looking back, I'm not convinced that I was ready to learn them in any other way than than that way. Than, than the way you did, yeah. So a lot of that is in hindsight. Do, do you think that you, you know, where did you get that self awareness to know that you had to go through it that way? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, I think the 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 path to self-awareness is self-examination mm, right mm -hmm. and i've always been very hard on myself and to some degree even it, that can be uh counterproductive i would argue that a lot of my suffering in those five years was self-inflicted by being so incredibly critical of myself in ways that wasn't productive or useful mm -hmm. um but i do think that you have to self-examine and just ask yourself try to look very take very harsh looks at like where you are compared to where you want to be um, and where you are compared to where you can be. And I think that the, the important distinction here is not necessarily, look, is there somebody that is more well, wealthier than me or is there somebody that has a bigger business than me? Because the answer to that will almost always be yes. And even if you're mm -hmm. the wealthiest person on earth, you won't be your entire life. Most likely somebody's right. going to surpass you at some point, right? So I think that that's, that's very difficult to – to use that measurement, but I think looking in the mirror, we all know if we are, you know, keeping our promises to ourselves and to others, and if we're doing the best we can. And I think that that was really the thing that made me really unhappy. Um, is that I, I knew every day I looked in the mirror and I knew I fucked around today. Mm -hmm. I didn't tackle some things that were scary. I didn't tackle some things that were difficult. And or I didn't keep the promises and the commitments that I'd made to myself. I set certain goals and I didn't go after them. Or I set certain um, to dos that I didn't uh, uh, check off. And and I think that 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 really is the 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 thing that I'm striving for today is not so much having some huge goal and accomplishing that, 
or comparing myself to others, but it's like looking in the mirror and going, did I do what I was supposed to do today? Did I give it my all? And if the answer is yes, I'm pretty cool with myself. If right. the answer is no, I can't be at peace with myself and okay with myself. And I think self-examining is a really big, big part of it. I think having people around you and close to you that um, you trust you know that you their judgment their assessment of things you trust right but they also you've also established a relationship that allows them to be critical of you a mm-hmm. lot of people mm-hmm. react very negatively to criticism, criticism. so people yeah. around them just stop criticizing them because there's nothing in it for me right yeah. being critical to you when you get really upset with me i'm like just gonna stop being critical with you mm-hmm. um so Really eliciting negative feedback, empowering and encouraging negative feedback, dealing really well with it, and you know, having people around you that, that you trust with their negative feedback, that you trust in their wisdom and their experience, um, as well as self-examining. I think those two things put together create a level of self-awareness and eventually a level of self-wisdom that then helps you kind of know where you are, where you're at. And the other thing is that yeah. with time and with age, you learn that um, in the moment it's very hard to know if something yeah. is good or bad or why things are happening because mm-hmm. you're too close to the event to have proper perspective to put it in context. Yep. So you just and, and this is something that takes time. It's very rare that somebody that's 20 years old will have that level of wisdom because they haven't lived enough years mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. to know that, right? When you're like a kid, you don't even take that into account. You go through school. So you have like two, three years of professional experience. It's not enough to know, you know, to, to have the wisdom to know that things take time and yeah. what you're going through right now may or may not be really important or really big or bad or insignificant. You learn with, with age right. to give things time before you evaluate them. It's such an interesting topic because we have this debate on the podcast all the time where ironically, the th- I mean, I won't speak for you, but in, in terms of Christian and myself, we'd argue a, a lot of the time that in order to reach a level of success, and again, success is subjective and attaining the goals that you want to mm-hmm. attain, um, oftentimes requires you to go through a lot of that um, and, yeah, and and experience yeah. a lot of those failures and then come out and have that those those thoughts and, and reflections in hindsight um, and so you know obviously the the goal of the podcast is to deliver value but in a lot of mm-hmm. ways it's just entertainment because um, I'm not sure yet that, that um, you know you could listen to a podcast read a book uh, you know, go through a program and actually get that specific piece of right. of what you need to attain those goals. And and it's interesting looking across now what like twenty episodes, about an hour of conversation each episode. Mm-hmm. There are some, at least from where I'm standing, repeatable there's, there's, elements. Yeah, there's a lot of common a lot of threads. folks. You know, s- sitting at this tape like uh, across this table. Um, didn't like school, um, right. really, really hard on themselves, mm-hmm. uh, uh, threw themselves into situations that they weren't ready for, yep. things like that. Anyways, a lot it's just of, super a lot of self-reflection mm-hmm. through the years, uh, having a good support system, which is what you were just saying. I think, sorry, I just want to like backtrack mm-hmm. a little mm-hmm. bit. I think that's like a super, super, super important piece to the puzzle that a lot of people tend to neglect. And it's almost like they think it's kind of like one or the other, but Steli, like, like you were saying, it's, you know, having sort of, uh, daily or monthly or whatever it is like reflection upon oneself, but also having that support system and also going through like, like time, time will tell, right? So like you have to go through the hoops and you, you've got to experience it for yourself. But I feel like some people just think it's maybe one or the other, but it's always it's typically a combination of, of everything mm-hmm. really. Like, I don't know if you could just peg it on one single thing. Yeah, of course. No, it's interesting. I, I think <laughs> just to, to, to comment on that, number one, people that you guys invite to the show have a certain level of external success, mm-hmm. right? Otherwise, you wouldn't know the the. There's a lot of people that live incredibly happy and fulfilled lives that we just are could never know about because they don't have external success at a right. at an uh, at a at a level that is very visible to. You're lots not of people, the first right? guest that brought that up either. 
and 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 then your podcast is called the art of the fail or something right so i mean <laughs> when you have that name it will attra- again you selecting people that have external success that have failure that feel comfortable talking about failure and being yep. invited to a podcast so it's just kind of like it's very self selecting a a, yeah. a a segment of population that will yes. have certain similarities I don't think that I don't think that listening to a podcast, reading a book, or, or talking to any human being, or consuming any kind of content can teach you everything you need to know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think it supplements your experience, uh, and and it might. I don't think that it, it can be the answer to all your problems, but it might. It might unlock something or contextualize something you're experiencing in a way that's helpful. And that you wouldn't be able to understand or interpret that way if you hadn't consumed anything, ever talked to anybody, ever read anything about this. Yep. So I think that it's a, it's more of a supplementation to experience than a, a substitute. Like you can't just not have experience and just read everything. But I don't think that it's not helpful. It's definitely, definitely uh, helpful and valuable. But like anything, if you only take the supplements and you don't take any real, mm-hmm, you don't mm-hmm. consume any real food you're going to get in trouble, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and and a bunch of people, I think, get into the habit of only wanting to read about things because it's a safer way to go through it and then right. think that they can just execute perfectly and that's ab- absolutely not possible. Yeah, that's that's a way better point than we made. Um, <laughs> uh, great. So uh, there's a couple directions I want to I wanna go with this. Um, but maybe if we take a step back um, and if you think it's it's interesting to talk about I'm I'm vaguely remembering an anecdote that you had had mentioned previously about your uh, experience at Y Combinator and your whole visa process around that. I think that that might might be interesting to talk about, and it also sort of highlights the fact that you know through that journey to the U.S. that you had, there was some successes along the way, and and I'd I'd love to hear that story. Yeah, so there's so many stories. I don't even know exactly what you uh, what you bring up, but I'll I'll share some some that relate to this. Um, I think that when I first came to the U.S. to just touch on the visa thing, um, I it could not apply for an H-1B because I, I have barely made it through kindergarten, right? So I don't have a college degree. I can't get an H-1B. Mm-hmm. You take the H-1B off the the table. There's very few options, right? Uh, getting married might be one, but I didn't know anybody at the time <laughs> to get married to. And and, and uh, one other obvious one was the investor visa. I didn't have enough money uh, to qualify for that. Mm-hmm. So most uh, lawyers that I talked to basically told me no. Like they told me, you know, you, you the best thing you have is no. Like I don't, we don't know how to get you a visa. It's going to be very very difficult. And then eventually I uh, talked to a lawyer that said, well, you know, there's this one visa status. It's kind of an anomaly. Um, it's the O-1, which is a visa for aliens with exceptional abilities. And the interesting thing about that is that exceptional ability is not super hardly and harshly defined. defined. It's kind yeah. of s- somewhat open to interpretation. Mm-hmm. There's a bunch of things you can do to prove that you're extraordinary. And, and so I asked, well, what, what are those things? It's like, well, you know, you have to get a lot of press. Um, you have to get a lot of uh, reference letters from people that are authorities in that field. And there was like a list of things that, that was described to me as like evidence for exceptional ability. And a lot of these things I was like, wait a sec, if I work hard, I could generate this stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I can I can make that stuff happen. And it was I, I think it was that type of thinking that, that led me to go, well, I'm just going to apply for this. You know, what's the worst that can happen? I'll get a no. It's better than not applying for anything and just going back to Europe. And I worked incredibly hard. It was probably a three, four month full-time job um, to create an application to prove that I was extraordinary in ability, uh, which I definitely probably wasn't back then. <laughs> but, I mean, it was, it was, you know, it took a lot of effort to convince a lot of amazing people to be nice to me and and agree to write me a letter and a bunch of other things to get a lot of outlets to write about me and my first application was 800 pages it's a massive app Jeez. and back then uh the one was very very rare mostly for people that were like artists or athletes that were very famous somewhere around the world and wanted to come to the u.s and things mm-hmm. of that nature and the application process typically would take about three months three to four months and if they said yes, you could say. If they said no, if you got rejected, you had 48 hours to leave the country. In my case, when I applied, it took them almost 10 months 
to respond. Oh, wow. Wow. And during, so imagine this, during those 10 months, every day I would go to the, to my <laughs> mailbox and try to figure out, do I have to leave today or not? Yeah, yeah. And then I would have to go to the office and try to build a company and raise money and build a product and all that. And Man, that's every, uh, yeah. you, everybody was asking me every week, any news on the visa? And I was always yeah. telling people, don't ask me about this shit. <laughs> Either I'm going to be back home in Europe or I'm going to be celebrating. You're not going to miss yeah, this. Yeah. Week, right? <laughs> but they couldn't help themselves. Every week, everybody was bothering me about this. So I have to imagine that whoever had to deal with the application every day was like taking those 800 pages and then going, nah, not today. <laughs> and, and I have to imagine that it was a coin flip. I got a little lucky. I don't know, right? The second time around, I had to reapply after five years. The second time around, I was now going through Y Combinator, right, applying for it. And this time around, I had a lot more proof that I was exceptional and I was able to get recommendation letters from Ashton Kutcher and from Paul Graham and from like really famous and mm -hmm. exceptional people. And there's this story of like Paul Graham, you know, I sent him a letter and I wrote a draft because I knew he's busy. Nobody has time to write three page letters about my life, right? And so I, I would write a draft and be like, hey, you could, you know, edit this draft or write something from scratch just to help you with some ideas. And he obviously being the genius he is, he's like, oh, I wanted to change the entire letter because it was terrible. But eventually, you know, I was just hounding him to, to for a signature, and eventually, I just printed it out, and I found him in the corner. I was just like, "Just sign this, you don't have time." <laughs> just like, cornered oh, him. God, okay. And he just signed it. And then later, he was telling the story to people, and was just saying, "You know, this is a great example of why Sally is right, a successful right. founder. Yep. He is just not gonna let go until he gets the work done that needs to get done." Right. Um, so, uh, and the same thing is, like in a weird way, same thing is true with Y Combinator. I had applied for YC a year before I moved to the US. It, and then during the five years of being in Silicon Valley, before I got into YC, I applied, I think, another four or five times. So in total, I applied like seven times to YC and I got rejected every time until mm -hmm. I got accepted. And they, it, it goes to prove how, it's not a proof that they were wrong. It's a proof how great they are in evaluating founders because the times they rejected me were totally the right choice. I didn't know why <laughs> those companies were not going anywhere. So, um, so it took a long time to get it into into YC, uh, and I got in at the at the right time when I was ready for it. Awesome. Um, so that's actually a good segue into mm -hmm. uh, the next direction I wanted to go. Uh, you have some unique insight, given that uh, are you still doing Elastic Sales, or is it just Close IO right now? It's just Close IO. Okay. We've not done Elastic in a long time. So. Still used to be one of the founders of Elastic Sales, if I'm if I'm correct, and and is basically a sales consultancy for venture back startups, and and now the founder of Close.io, and and a really good mentor and advisor to a lot of uh, startups and companies and, and entrepreneurs. So you have a lot of perspective around, um, you know how how founders operate in in those early stages of of a business. And I know your your big you know shtick is is sales and growth, and so I'm wondering if there's any anecdotes or or any um, of like the top one or two sales mistakes that um, young entrepreneurs make early on that could be mitigated. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'll give you I'll give you three. Right, um, number one. I think is that uh, one of the biggest mistakes that founders make is they they uh, they don't sell, they advocate. Mm. There's a difference, right? Advocating means they just go out and they talk loosely about their idea and company. They talk enthusiastically about it. And what they're trying to elicit is positive feedback. Right. Right. They're looking for positive reinforcement on their idea, on their logo, on their company name, on their plans. And when you're out there and you're like, enthusiastically talking about your idea, your baby, and you're like all like wide-eyed uh, uh, looking at somebody and and obviously communicating to them verbally and non-verbally that what you want them to tell you is that they like your idea and you're doing well. <laughs> what you're going to get is a lot of people to give you that, you know, yep. to give you that, to be like, yeah, that sounds cool. That's mm -hmm. a co cool idea. Best of luck with it. And, and that's the biggest waste of time possible. Right. Um, you need to sell. And the thing I love about sales is that it creates moments of truth. There's no space for interpretation. Right. There's no space for bullshit. 
there's no like, oh, we had a really great meeting. And I think they really love what we do and we really love what they do. Well, that's nice. But you're in business to create value. You're not in business to have positive, polite, friendly conversations. That's not going to make this company a success yep. and pay the bills. So the beauty of sales is it's, it's creating moments of truth. It's one thing for me to tell you, hey, my idea is X, Y, Z. Do you think it's a cool idea? It's another thing for me to tell you, this is my idea. Would you buy it? Would you be a customer or a user? Do you, are you going to download my app right now? Right? Are you going to give me your credit card information? And people and founders are uncomfortable asking that, going selling versus advocating, because selling will generate failure <laughs> and rejection. Yeah. It will make mm -hmm. more often than not people tell you, "Oh, I like the idea, but I would buy it." Right. And that's something founders don't want to hear. Right? They don't want to hear the negativity. They only want to hear good things. And so. If you only want to hear good things, if you want to only elicit for positive reinforcement, <coughs> you're going to fail as a founder. Um, and you're, not, you're not made for, for running a business. Sales will get you the truth, which is what you should really be seeking for. Mm -hmm. It's not Absolutely. positivity and encouragement, but truth. Are you ready to buy? No. No is a great answer. It's an amazing answer. When somebody tells me no, the feeling I, I have two feelings appreciation mm -hmm. and curiosity yeah right most people when they hear no the feeling they have is crushing depression or anger right either they're like no i'm what why no what, 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 what. they get all angry <laughs> or they get all like deflated oh my god this is never gonna work they get all like self-pity and like uh, no Right? I am appreciative and I'm curious. Yep. I appreciate you being honest. I'm like, fuck, finally somebody that's honest with me. Yeah. I know you'll get zero benefit from telling, telling me no. I know that's risky to tell no because you don't know if I'm going to get angry. You don't know if I'm going to be a pest to you. So I appreciate you being honest. And then I'm curious. I want to learn. Right. Ooh, you're not ready to buy yet? Help me out here. What is missing? What would you need to buy? What sucked about my pitch? Now we're getting to something. Now we're getting to a real conversation. So you have to sell. You can't just advocate. And then you have to follow up and follow through. Like fortune is in the follow up. Everybody just wants to show up. Mm -hmm. right? And that is an important step. But showing up is not enough, right? People want to show up, ha have a first conversation, and then the deal happens on yep. its own afterwards. It doesn't happen that way. And the number one reason why it doesn't happen that way is that the world is a busy and distracting and noisy place. And once you stop the conversation with a prospect or somebody, a potential partner, they go back to their life where you are and not the center of it. And they yep. get distracted. They have other priorities, other things that are happening. If you don't champion the relationship and you are not persistent and consistent to bringing it up again and again and again until it's the right time for them to take another look and decide if they want to move forward or not – Nine out of ten times, you're never going to accomplish anything, right? So falling up and falling through is something founders don't like to do. Again, it's hard work. It's not glamorous. It means a lot of emotional rejection, right? Every time I email you and you don't respond to me, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of an emotional rejection that I get. And people like to avoid that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if you sell, if you go for rejection and the known for the truth versus for encouragement and positivity, if you follow up and follow through and you don't just show up and then expect the world to come back to you and purchase your product and do all the heavy lifting for you. If you don't do these mistakes, you're going to be in a great place. But that's, those are some of the biggest mistakes I see most founders, especially first time founders do. Awesome. Well, yeah, that was great. I might, I'm actually really glad that you asked that. Cause this is like, you know, obviously we're talking about your own experiences and anecdotes and like your background, but having something like that, that is so critical to probably every single one of our listeners or watchers, it, it that's like super valuable. And I think that's something that people, uh, you know, whether you're part of a company as an employee or a founder, like you need to be aware of those exact things right there. Mm -hmm. Like it's tough and you're right. You know, no one wants to face the emotional burden of rejection in, in getting that no but it, in order to get the yes you have to get those 10 no's first is there any uh just while we're on that just quickly is there any tactics on uh, aside from just doing it um to uh, encourage yourself to go for no quicker 
Yeah, well, I would. Um, so there's two things. One is you can do some psychological reprogramming mm -hmm. by focusing on collecting no's versus yeses, right? Um, you know, instead of so, so then the no becomes part of progress. It's not a, it's not you know, if I, if I'm trying to get my first customer, and, and my goal is you know this month I need to get one yes basically, right? I need to get one person to become a customer, say yes to the deal. Then every time I hear a no, feels like something that throws me back on my goal, and will feel really, really negative. Versus if I say, if I reprogram myself and say, okay, I want one customer this month, one yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what my current metrics and funnel will look like, but let's best guess how many people will tell, will I have to mm -hmm. ask for a deal to get a yes? Right. Let's say I have a ten percent conversion rate, so I'm going to have to hear ten times no or nine times no to get one yes. Mm -hmm. That's really then, good. Then. I would make my goal not to get to the yes. I would make my goal to get to nine no's as quickly right. as possible. Yeah. Right. Right. And so now every time I hear a no, I'm like, Shh. I can check it off and be like, all right, just seven more no's. <laughs> all right, six more times. Get, no. get excited about <laughs> the no's. And now it's still going to suck. Now I'm not going to pretend yeah. that that alone will make this a super enjoyable experience, but it will also make it feel like you're progressing. You're coming closer to your end goal, right. which is important. To, to keep going. Um, so that's one quick tip. Um, the other thing is just tactically, I would just learn to ask this question. Like the, the, the first step that you need to do when you try to sell is understand the customer mm -hmm. or your prospect, right? So you want to ask a bunch of questions to truly understand what is their situation, what are their challenges, what are the problems? Does this really fit with what I'm building, what I'm trying to do? And once you're convinced that they could truly be a good fit for your solution, then you know, you want right away to ask the question, hey, you know, it sounds like what we're building could fit really well for you. Let me ask you, what will it take? What will it take for you to become a customer of ours? Right? Mm -hmm. You have this problem. I built this solution from where we are right now in time and space. What would it take? What are all the steps we would have to take for you to continually become a customer? You ask that question really early in the process and you follow up with follow up questions once they tell you an answer and to, until you really have a full picture. Now you have a roadmap of what the steps are that you have to take, what are the things that you need to do right. to make it happen. So I would just ask that question really, really early in the conversation. You know, as early as the moment you're convinced, I think that they would be an ideal customer. Ask the question right away, hey, what will it take for you to become a customer of ours? That's interesting. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the last question before we, we wrap up here then. Uh, Presumably, these challenges change. Um, you know, once you 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 you've realized some success, and 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 you also you know have a lot of um, insight um, and access to a lot of companies, including your own, that have sort of matured through that stage. So, could could you shed some light on maybe what that one big failure or hurdle is in terms of sales later down the road? You've got your you know your two hundred first clients and, and you've got some repeatability uh what changes in that process so the so the, i'll say two things one thing that's specific and then one thing that's a bit more generic to this but i think it's important so specifically a, a challenge when it comes to selling as you are growing a little bit of maturing the early days is is typically that the customers you acquire in the early days might not be your ideal customers, right? In the beginning, you're just going to acquire anybody and everybody you can. And you're not going to know necessarily who's going to be your best customer, best defined not by necessarily paying you the most money and definitely not defined by the happiest mm -hmm. that tells you all the time how much they like you or like your solution. But best defined by success, and success means they're getting an incredible ROI on the money they are paying you from your product or solution, and they know it, right? So your best customers are the ones that get the most value from your company, and that are the most aware of that value. Yeah. Because sometimes you can create incredible value to a customer, but the customer doesn't see it that way or doesn't know about it. Mm -hmm. So those are your best customers. And it's going to take usually about 100 or so customers in most cases, unless we're talking enterprise sales where every customer is multi-million dollar deals. But in any other case, it's going to take you a good amount, maybe 30, 40, 50, 100 <coughs> customers until you have enough of a sample size to be able to even answer the question, who is really getting an incredible amount of value and realizes that, right? 
who are those customers? What do they have in common? And then focus on those. Most companies, the challenge they have is that once they get to 100 or so, or 200, they think they're ready to scale. So now what they're doing is they're going to go out there and raise a ton of money to then just go from 100 customers to 1,000 or 10,000 customers, but they never you know, kind of slow down to analyze what are really good customers and what are really bad customers, right? Instead of just acquiring hmm. anybody you can, let's focus on the ones that really make a difference. And I have this all the time where, you know, and this is heartbreaking, where a company will get to 100 customers. I had this a few months ago. Um, 100 customers raises a Series B and ask me, the founders ask me all these questions about new verticals and new industries and how to expand from what they're doing. And I was like, well, guys, tell me, who's your most successful customer you know, based on the criteria that I just outlined? And there was silence, three founders on the mm-hmm. phone, silence for like five seconds. And then one founder goes, I don't know how you guys yeah. feel about this, but I have no idea. Mm-hmm. And the other two went, yeah, we don't really know. And I'm like, that's your problem, yeah. right? And that's the reason why you're looking for new industries and new mm-hmm. verticals because there might be an insecurity that mm-hmm. the customers you have right now are not going to stay with you and are not getting that much value from you. And the, the, there's nothing that sucks more than you know, pinning down and raising a ton of money based on a model that cannot scale because fundamentally mm-hmm. it's not sound. So that's a big challenge a lot of people, a lot of sales teams and, and companies get to at the later stages. I want to say something more generic that applies sales, non-sales to everybody. Okay, yeah, please. Yeah, please. As you grow... As you grow and as you scale and as you succeed in business, the biggest the the, the biggest challenge at some point, if you succeed, if you don't succeed, that's your challenge, right? <laughs> if you succeed, right? if you succeed, then your challenge is to change, hmm. right? And this is something I have heard, I, I had heard my entire life, and every time I heard this, I went, that makes sense. Yeah, what got you here won't get you there. And, you know, at every kind of new phase of the scaling of the business, mm-hmm. you'll have to completely change the way you do things. Totally makes sense. But just intellectualizing and understanding something on an intellectual level doesn't mean you're going to actually put it in practice in reality. The biggest challenge is always that at some point, you and your organization, your company has to change. The world is changing. Your customers are changing. Your competitors are changing. Right. The scale of your business is changing. So you're going to have to become a master in changing as a business and organization to get to that next level. And change is really, really hard, right? And Mm -hmm. so most people, once they succeed, they've been waiting for success their whole life. Once they finally get success, they don't want to fucking change. They want to just keep doing what they're doing. That's actually a really good uh, insight. Yeah. Yeah. So, so and, and, and this has been uh, true for us. We've built a very successful business, many, many mm-hmm. millions. It's a huge business, awesome, all great. But, you know, when I look at the last two years, could we have been a much bigger, much better business the last two years? Yes. Why haven't we? Change. There's certain right. things that needed to change that I was even intellectually aware of. I was like, yeah, if we want to get to that next level, mm, we have to do these <laughs> difficult changes. But then I didn't do it. Right. I didn't because I didn't want to change myself. And so uh, it took it took way too much time for me to really embrace that change. And now in the next uh, Mm -hmm. two years, I guarantee you we're going to have another uh, another really um, amazing growth trajectory in our company. But um, learning to get good at changing as you grow and as you succeed, that is the biggest challenge, because as you find success, you want to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. And if you want to hold on to something you're going to start seeing failure eventually because the world is moving on and what worked up until this point isn't working to get you to the next level. Awesome. Uh, that's a, a beautiful callback too from the, <laughs> one of the first uh, questions that Christian asked. Absolutely. Uh, awesome, Steli. Uh, really interesting story, some amazing mm-hmm. insights in, in, a, in a small amount of time. Christian, do you want to close us off? Absolutely. Uh, So the way we like to close things off is now ask you another question. Uh, Who would you like to see on the show? This could be someone that you are either a really good friend with, uh, you know, someone who maybe you co-host a podcast with. Uh, (laughs) What? No, I'm not. It's not a leading (laughs) question at all. (laughs) Um, Who would you like to see? come on the show with us and talk about failure? Or do you know anyone that has a really good story that would be a good guest? 
So here's the, somebody that comes to mind, and this is a little bit unorthodox, right? So the person that I would want to see on this show is somebody that is not yet that well known, mm-hmm. but is going to be a superstar. Um, somebody that has already tasted a lot of success in his life and is he's very young in his career. And the reason why I want him on the show is because I don't know how much failure he has experienced, but I'm sure there is some. And maybe right. he's just hiding it well. Right. Maybe he just has such an amazing attitude. I don't know what it is, but I'd love to see you guys spar with him and see if you can uncover <laughs> some of the challenges okay. that he has in his life. Uh, his name is Busty Aarons. Uh, he's the founder of wildaudience.com. Okay. Okay. Um, he's an amazing human being. I think you guys are going to love him and become friends with him. Uh, and Sweet. he's definitely a superstar in the making. But when I look at him at his young age and everything he's accomplished and how wise he is, we're good friends. Yeah. I'm always amazed. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I definitely <laughs> was not as, <laughs> a, a, as smart about things and as fast about things as he has. But I'm sure there's a lot of failure and some challenges in there that you guys are going to be able to uncover. So I would recommend him as the next guest. That's awesome. Awesome. That's, uh, yeah. That's super incredible. I like that answer. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, Steli. Well, uh, thanks again for coming on, uh, spending some time with us. Have a great rest of your day, yep. and uh, keep fucking up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Steli. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. And thank you. No, not you. Yeah. Thank you for watching today's episode. Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, before you leave, please subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you know when we put out new content. And there's some recent videos somewhere here okay (laughs) check those out because we got a lot of good content a lot of good episodes for you a lot of failures a lot of fuck-ups including our own that's it